Yeah, um, hello everyone. So Peter gave a quick introduction to the entire Web3 stack, basically. Uh, how Web3 is supposed to look, what those interlocking parts are. And I'm gonna dive a bit deeper into the one that he spent the most time at the end uh, talking about, which is this piece of infrastructure for connecting different blockchains. Uh, so just as a, as a bit of a recap, we have blockchains with many different kinds of state machines uh, which, which do different things for smart contracts or supply chain or um, very fast transactions or uh, there are a myriad of different use cases. And basically what we're trying to do with, with Polkadot is to connect them all in a secure way and provide that as a piece of infrastructure for the Web3 app building community. Uh, so as a bit of introduction, I'm Robert Habermeyer. I'm working with Parity Technologies to build the first implementation of Polkadot. Uh, I also do a bit of research onto the uh, consensus algorithm and just the economic games around it, uh, and I'll be diving into those as well. So the title of the talk is Polkadot, Let's Connect the Dots. Uh, that just sounded cool. It doesn't really have that much to do with what's actually in the talk. Um, so first, I'll just give a bit of a, of a recap as to what our motivations are with Polkadot. Uh, then I'll dive a lot into the tech. I'm going to talk about exactly how it works, uh, what the parts are, and then I'll talk about our roadmap, basically where we are now, what's left to do, and what's coming up in the next few months. So one major motivation behind Polkadot is this idea of interoperability between blockchains. So to connect blockchains with distinct state machines and consensus algorithms. Uh, and in doing so to support the past, present, and future. So by past, I mean what's already been built. Uh, so that would be like your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, your Monero, your Litecoin, your Dogecoin, and so on. Um, present is basically what are the limits of the current technology that we have at our disposal. So what kind of chains are going to be built that we can foresee? Like what's coming up next and we know about? And future is Basically, these ideas over the next 10 years are going to evolve a lot. They are going to become vastly more complex and efficient and secure than we are working with right now. And people are going to build chains that we can't even imagine right now. And we want to be able to support, in an interoperability framework, all three of these things. So what's already been built, what could be built that we know about, and even things that we can't even really imagine yet. Uh, and one other thing would be this idea of public and private running in the same network. So we have these public open permissionless chains combined with private permissioned consortium chains uh, where they don't have to give full control over the data shepherded by that chain over to the public, but can still provide it to them and, and allow it to be passed into applications at that level. Um, another main motivation of Polkadot is to provide this co-security or pooled security. So connecting blockchains is pretty hard, but securing them is also hard. And a lot of the time they have to compete with each other over resources. And we see this mostly with uh, proof of work, but it's actually true with proof of stake as well. Uh, so with proof of work, you only have a, a limited amount of computing power and you basically have to choose whether you put it on chain A, chain B, or chain C. And every miner is basically doing the same thing. So it's a zero sum game. What one chain loses in mining power, the other one gains. Um, so Polkadot takes a different approach by letting chains pool that security. And this is actually a really interesting idea for developers because a lot of the time when you have an innovative idea as a blockchain developer, it's not really focusing on how you secure the transactions in that chain. It's a lot more about how you, what, what that chain actually does. So it, you know, as a developer of a, of a, a new innovative blockchain, you don't really think about you know, do I want this proof of work algorithm or this proof of stake or how do we set up the incentives or does it use this classical consensus algorithm underneath? You don't really care about that, you just care that it is secure. And pooled security is really nice for that because you can focus all your development effort onto just building the thing that you want to build and then plug it into something that gives it security. Uh, so that's just a, a, a diagram to explain that phenomenon that I was speaking about earlier where um, chains are competing over security resources between each other versus when they can pool them and actually get a higher attack threshold than they would have before. Um, the other and 
maybe the most pressing motivation behind Polkadot is this idea of scalability. So we have multiple chains running in, parachain, uh, in parallel, and we would call those parachains. And if we can execute them in parallel, we might actually be you know, doing more work overall. So uh, the, the idea is that at this root level, we have a very scalable system that you can plug chains into, uh, but those chains themselves might also be tools for scalability, so it sort of cascades. Um, and lastly, as Peter mentioned, there's this technology that's being used to build Polkadot, which is called Parity Substrate, and that's basically just a framework for building blockchains. So uh, at Parity, we've done that a bunch of times, so we did that with Parity Ethereum, and did that with Parity Bitcoin, and then when we started Polkadot, uh, we were basically writing our third blockchain like node from scratch. Uh, and we kind of realized that there's this need, especially in the community, that for a piece of technology, a, a framework for writing blockchains, where you just say, okay, this is what I want it to do, and you get the networking and consensus and all that other stuff for free. Uh, and this would also have something of an upgrade path into the Polkadot network, where a chain written for Substrate could probably very easily be ported onto the Polkadot network as a parachain. Uh, but that could be its own talk, so I'm just going to leave it at that for now. Um, so now, get into the technical breakdown of it. So, in terms of which technologies we're using, we're, like, I would pinpoint three key things. So the first is the Rust programming language, and that's like a, a super safe, secure, and also efficient. So it sort of occupies that niche that C and C++ have historically, but it also has those static checks that you might see in a language like Haskell that give you lots and lots of guarantees about the data that you're writing code over uh, and to make sure that nothing bad happens and it really eliminates entire classes of errors and we found it to be tremendously useful in writing uh, vastly parallel software that doesn't crash and also is provably not nearly as attackable as if we had written it in another language. Um, the other piece of technology at the programming level that I would talk about is WebAssembly. So what we've seen is a lot of blockchains writing their own scripting language for uh, how you know, smart contracts or the code should be executed on there. And that means that they have to basically build the compiler for the scripting language, the interpreter, optimize it, uh, build tools for it for formal verification, uh, developer tools, development environments. Um, and we saw that with WebAssembly, actually the entire web browser community, which is backed by Google and Mozilla and Apple and Microsoft, are basically coming together to build this WebAssembly thing. And that's a super performant, portable, fast, well-supported, low-level target. So we can use that and get basically all that compiler support for the last 30 years uh, that's been put into uh, developing things like LVM and now applies to WebAssembly uh, and get all of that. And yeah, it'll get language support and, and it, it'll be, it, it'll, it's just going to be great. It's just going to be great. Um, so the last thing would be libp2p. Uh, so libp2p is just a, a, coming from our friends at Protocol Labs. They came up with a like a nice set of standards for lib for peer-to-peer -peer networking, uh, and we've done a Rust implementation of that, and we're using it in Polkadot. Uh, and there's lots and lots of different roles in the Polkadot network, which you're going to see next, and they have very complex sort of methods of connecting each other, what they send to each other, and so on. And libp2p is really useful for that. Uh, so our design principles are primarily that, one, it should be heterogeneous, that we support an ecosystem of diverse and complementary utilities. You have parachains, these parallelizable chains that are in the Polkadot network, uh, each fulfilling a very unique but also extremely useful niche and doing it well. And because of the interoperability, you can write applications that leverage all of them. Uh, we want it to be scalable, on-chain and off-chain, layer one and layer two, uh, with an ultra-efficient root layer. So. That would be basically parachains at layer one, which are very efficient uh, and useful for scalability. Essentially like parachains that might even act like a sharded blockchain itself. Uh, and then you also have these layer two things that you can build on top of some specialized parachain, like a, a parachain just for plasma or a parachain uh, just for state channels. And by an ultra efficient root layer, I just mean that we want the code that evaluates the parachain logic to be extremely quick and this is something that you don't get, for example, if you have gas meter Turing complete smart contracts, uh, because then you have to basically stop after every tiny machine instruction you've executed and say, okay, now we deduct a little fee, and so on. And that slows execution a lot. And if you have that at the root layer, it sort of propagates into every little bit of execution that you want to do on the platform. Uh, so we're sort of 
building a different economic gain that still gets us the same security, but has this efficient root layer that'll give us more scalability with everything that builds on top of it. Um, so to explain parachains a bit, it's basically three parts, a validity function, a collator node, and a message queue. So the validity function is just a piece of web assembly that takes a block header and a, like a proof, like it could be uh, some set of accounts, a million accounts or something that have been touched by the blocks transactions. Uh, it could be a zero knowledge proof, like uh, it's very general. So then it also has a call later node which creates candidate blocks that will pass this validity function which evaluates to true or false. So call laters create blocks that evaluate to true. Uh, and then there are also the message queues between the parachains and that's how we actually achieve that part of interoperability. Uh, so at a 10,000 foot view, it looks something like this. We have a relay chain that coordinates consensus and transaction delivery between chains. Uh, transaction here is actually what I would call messages. Uh, it's not necessarily transactions, but just arbitrary data being passed that could be transactions. Um, then we have the parachains, which are these attached chains again. And lastly, there's a special class of parachains that are, like, deserve their own category uh, called bridges, which are just those that it acts like a parachain to the relay chain, but really it's just a bridge over to some other chain that already exists. Um, so to talk a bit about the relay chain mechanics, uh, our first role is, well, okay, I'll go back a slide. Uh, I'm just gonna outline the four roles that are go into the analysis of the Polkadot network here, what they do, basically with a little picture as well. Um, so first we have the validators. They are the ones who author relay chain blocks. They do candidate agreement over the parachain. So a collator gives a validator a parachain candidate, says, hey, this is good. The validator sort of looks at it, passes it around with the other validators, um, comes to an agreement with them over, over where it's good. You get some kind of minimal economic attestations uh, that are used to sort of provide economic security for it. Uh, and then they also uh, provide availability for this external data, like the proof that I was mentioning before. If you have a proof of something touching one million accounts, that's way too big to store on chain. So we also have to keep that available. Um, and these validators are actually shuffled every block or two or three or four. Over some period, they switch which parachain they look at. So every validator is looking at one parachain in any given point of time, but you know, over time, that's going to change. Uh, then we have the nominators. So what the nominators do is they basically put up stake on behalf of good validators. So the validators are staked entities. It's in a proof of stake system. But we have this trade-off, like this fundamental trade-off between economic security and decentralization. So uh, if you have only a few parties participating in the consensus, then probably they haven't put forth all that much money themselves, but they still have a lot of power over the system. So there's not that much economic security in overcoming that validator set. But if you have too many uh, uh, people participating in the consensus, the amount of work that they have to do actually grows with the square of that. And that's, you know, it'll become vastly inefficient. So the nominators are sort of how we break out of this by uh, allowing participants in the system to say, I think this validator is good, put down money on his behalf, and then basically attach more economic security to this person. Uh, so that if this person misbehaves, the nominators behind him also get slashed. So that puts a very strong incentive on the nominators to choose those who are good. Um, then we have the, the collators, as I mentioned before. So each collator is on a specific parachain. They create parachain blocks for that parachain, give them to validators to participate in the consensus, and they also monitor their parachain subnetwork for misbehavior. Uh, for example, if the validators sneaked in a uh, bad parachain block. So the fishermen are the last role, and they basically uh, do this, this bit of watching for misbehavior without creating blocks. So this is like a super easy role to get into. It's not permissioned in any form. You don't have to register to become a fisherman. You can just be a fisherman uh, and watch for misbehavior on a specific parachain. And then if you witness any, you can post like an irrefutable proof on the network and that will lead to whoever committed the misbehavior being slashed. And that's what I refer to in the slide as the validity or availability game. Um, and this is a, a, a very simple diagram that will explain <laughs> everything. Um, so, but you know, just to walk through it really quickly, we have uh, the relay chain at the center. The triangles are different colors. Uh, those are validators and the colors represent which parachain they're attached to. We have the different parachains attached on the sides and those are different colors to, and shapes to represent that they do vastly different things. Uh, on the right, 
is worth mentioning, this idea that we have a parachain which is also a relay chain, what we would call a second order relay chain. Uh, and that's one tool for uh, scalability that we've thought of, which is to have this hierarchical scalability where essentially you have a tree-like structure of blockchains. And you know, messages might have to propagate up a long way to reach other chains, but you have this security flowing from the root and that might prove immensely valuable. Uh, and then at the bottom we have a parachain bridge. Uh, so we can see on each parachain there's like a collator swarm. There's a, on the green one they've zoomed in, shown the collators. They also show the fishermen there. Uh, yeah, okay, enough of that picture. Um, so ensuring validity is kind of hard because only, like as I said, we only have a basic threshold of validators checking each parachain candidate. So uh, that means that if we have this overall security threshold of like, 33% can be bad, and we take random samples of that set where 33% are bad, we might get a sample sometimes where all of them or majority are bad. Uh, so that means that bad stuff can actually sneak through, and that's why we have this validity game. Um, this, this part is actually easy. Um, the availability part is a lot harder. Uh, so checking those parachain blocks requires that off-chain data, like that proof of a million accounts that I talked about before. Um, ensuring that this data stays available is really hard because if you want to report somebody for not providing data, you can't really tell the difference between that person not providing the data and you refusing to listen. So if I report someone, say, hey, you're not providing that data, and then they make it available, it's really hard to see after the fact, okay, were they lying or was the guy who reported lying? Um, so we have to fall back on reputational guarantees at this point where we do some kind of super majority of stake pinpointing the people who are bad in a, 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 a basically a game where they're voting but don't necessarily realize that they're voting. Uh, and we would use these, this BLS aggregate signature that uh, Jeff really likes. Um, anyway, um, so our goals are that consensus has a low barrier to entry that it's fairly cheap to become a validator uh, to separate block production from finality of the blocks uh, and to make use of the blockchain structure in achieving consensus over which blocks are final. Uh, and this is something that's actually, I think, the most interesting part, which is that generally consensus algorithms are being run over individual blocks. So you, when you want to produce a block, you just get full consensus over this block. But actually, you know, you could have a consensus algorithm which is being run over the chain piecewise as it's being produced. And I'll, I'll have some diagrams to explain that a bit, and hopefully you'll see why that's, uh, think that that's as cool as I do. Um, so the block production basically works like this. We have a round-based, probabilistically safe system with a very large pool of validators, like 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 or so, uh, randomly chosen samples, and authors are aware shortly before it's their turn to author a block that it will be their turn to author a block. Uh, and that'll look something like this. So, you know, there's this big pool of validators. They each get randomly selected to author a block. And then there's this parachain subagreement going on within that, uh, that block authorship process. Um, in the future, this might look a bit different. So we have, might have something like aggregate block production by multiple validators at once, like combining multiple like, part blocks into one um, with compact or commutative proofs of execution. That's really fast and fairly fork tolerant, but we run a finality gadget over it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, with the finality gadget, so basically what a finality gadget does, like at its core, and you might hear about this with Casper FFG, is basically provide economic security on some block. So we say, okay, if this block ever gets reverted, this amount of stake is going to get slashed. So that's what we're doing with our finality gadget. But we're trying to do it in a very efficient way, where if I vote on a block, it's also counted as a vote on a, all the blocks before it, all the way to the genesis. Uh, and that means that you know, we can, even if we have different validators seeing different chains, those chains will have a common ancestor. And that common ancestor can be finalized even if those validators don't agree on what the current head of the chain is. Um, and this will probably be with a small, focused, and highly staked pool that also ensures availability. Uh, so here's a little diagram to show that. Like, none of these validators are directly voting on that common ancestor, but because they have that common ancestor, we've got a super majority agreement on it. And this is a bit of a simplification over how it actually works, but it's good enough to give the idea. Um, and now that, that, now that block can be finalized, and we can say for sure that this block will never be reverted, there will never be any chain finalized that doesn't include this block, uh, 
without one third or more of all the stake in the system getting slashed. And that's a, a very powerful guarantee. Uh, so just to take inventory really quickly of what we've done so far and what's next to come. Uh, so what we have so far is released two proof of concepts. So we released the first proof of concept, I don't know, a uh, couple months ago, and that was basically on-chain governance, so a, a, vo a voting system, uh, bicameral government, with proof of stake, a basic user interface, and forkless upgrades. And that's gonna be really interesting talking about proof of concept two, which we launched yesterday. So uh, forkless upgrades are this idea that we can actually change the entire logic of the chain like what transactions do without restarting the chain. And we actually did that yesterday when we launched Proof of Concept 2. Um, in what we think was the first time ever. Uh, so what Proof of Concept 2 has is this initial co-finalization of parachains. So parachains don't talk to each other yet. The message queues are going to come a bit later. Uh, in the next couple of proof concepts, and also had a basic light client. And it was, the, as I said, the first dynamic upgrade. Um, and this code did not exist when, when proof of concept one was launched. Uh, so what's next is proof of concept three. So we're starting to get down to that now. That would be implementation of hybrid consensus as described in these slides. So that block production finality gadget, two pieces, both being implemented, but providing like a very fast speed of growth for the relay chain, but also fast speed of finality and good security guarantees. Uh, proof of concept four will be an implementation of these validity and availability games. And in parallel with proof of concept three and four, we're basically at the stage where people can start writing parachains. Like the documentation isn't there at all. It's gonna get there. Um, but like even today I was playing around with writing a little dummy parachain uh, to deploy onto the, the Polkadot POC2. Maybe one of you will uh, beat me to it. But basically, it's there. Uh, and we're going to work on that a bit more and start to get that into the hands of developers. So uh, that might be cool. Um, call for contributors. Peter got to this a bit already, but basically in the Polkadot ecosystem, uh, researchers, parachain implementers, educators, and community leaders are immensely important. If you feel like you can fit one of these roles, I think it would be great to just reach out, talk to Peter uh, or Jack or any of the other guys from Web3 or myself, and like, we're interested to see how you can help. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, so I will take questions. Yes, and, and I will repeat the questions after they're asked. Um. What's your name? What's my name? It's uh, Robert. Yeah. I, I repeated it. Uh, uh. Oh, uh, yes, some questions. Yes, please. Yes, uh, there's also a guy behind you, but I'm looking. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Oh, okay, he got there first. Go. Uh, okay. Yeah. That, no, that's. So I, I think the question is. Um, how does how does Casper FFG differ from the finality gadget that we have? Okay. So Casper FFG is done with on-chain voting, where basically every 50, 100 blocks, there's some epoch length, and every that many blocks, somebody casts a vote, and like from their the last epoch they thought was good and the, la and like the, the next one that they think is good. Um, and then with this, you can actually get those properties of accountable safety. Our finality gadget is off-chain, so basically you can get finality as fast as possible. So it could be even within one block or two. Uh, but the accountable safety has to be proven through a, basically a challenge response period on-chain. So there's, we have a synchronous mechanism for finding um, what we would call equivocations or things like double votes. And if we detect some kind of failure of uh, the finality gadget, we can go through this procedure and then get the votes on chain and slash. But with Casper FFG, the slashing is a bit easier, but we think that the trade-off for faster finality is important. Um, yes, you had a question. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, so what is the randomness beacon that we use for shuffling validators? Um, so right now we're using something from a paper called collective coin flipping, uh, which is basically just um, iterated, a process of iterated majority of bits in previous block hashes. Uh, then there's also, I don't know, we're looking into basically what's best. That's what we're using right now. We will also look into Randau. Uh, BLS threshold signatures are their own thing. Uh, basically it's non-attributable misbehavior and I don't know, might work. Um, but we haven't decided completely yet. Uh, yes, please. Are you planning to support other languages in Rust or? Um, yeah, so support anything that compiles down to WebAssembly for parachains. So typically low level languages, probably not anything with a runtime or garbage collector that's too big. Um, Rust is really just what we're building in. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you want to avoid in the root layer the smart contract execution which charges a fee per line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it would basically be uh, subjective. So they would, the validators would have to come to an agreement off-chain, uh, essentially, what is the limit on computation that we're willing to do. Um, uh, to repeat the question, it was uh, how do you, or if, if not using gas metering, how do we measure the amount of computation that's being done? Um, POC3, we're thinking in the next month or two, and then POC4 following that, a few more months. So this, I think these two POCs will basically get us about 85% of the way to actual polka dot, uh, and this would be like the next six, eight months or something. But estimates. Um, yes, please. You had a, in the red shirt, you had a, a question, right? Or, uh, no, I guess not. Uh, <laughs> I thought I saw you raising your hand earlier, sorry. Um, yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, maybe Polkadot will be like... Be Ah, like the beacon chain. Okay, so the question was with Ethereum 2.0 sharding, would Polkadot be something like the beacon chain? Um, I think there are a lot of parallels between the um, Ethereum sharding and the Polkadot structure. To be honest, I'm not completely up to date on like what the latest sharding organization is, um, but the rules, the rules are fairly different. I think, yes, in the sense that it basically starts to move computation off chain into blobs with economic games after the fact to ensure validity, they're very similar. Um, yes, okay. There's a challenge response period, how does that consider like, this option? Yeah, so um, we would have a yeah, so essentially, okay, the, the, the question was, uh, if there's a challenge response period, how do you consider that or achieve instant finality off chain? That's a really good question. So uh, essentially the way we're considering it now is that we will have finality. So we're leaning between two approaches. So the first approach would actually be achieve finality as fast as possible on chains and perhaps after some amount of like even more off-chain economic attestations happen to then do off-chain finality. Um, or we wait before the, the challenge response period is over before using blocks as input into the finality gadget. Uh, and then users would simply use the economic attestation scheme. Something like, um, I don't know if you've seen Vitalik's post on um, crypto economic light clients, but it would be something like that uh, that basically everybody would use just to see if uh, the chain that they have synced locally is secure before looking at the finality gadget. Uh, and one more in the back. Is there anything for facilitating state availability for light clients? Um, 
So specifically, I think the, the crux of the issue is availability for basically everyone, because everybody is a light client on some parachain. But is your concern the uh, availability of relay chain data for light clients, so some kind of incentive scheme for full nodes to serve that, or? Yeah, so basically we are falling back onto somewhat reputational, like high super majority um, sort of secret voting, not secret, but uh, votes where the participants don't necessarily know that they're voting on whether somebody is withholding data. Uh, and this would be used to reputationally pinpoint someone who is withholding. Yeah, uh, thank you very much.